Well, our passage today is again about Mary. It's found in Luke chapter 1, verses 41 to 45. Let me read it to you. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Well, as you know, I'm a preacher. I write sermons, that is, I write speeches. And in order to get better at my craft, I listen to speeches that other people give. And I've come to appreciate some of the great speeches of our era. Let me tell you my top four. There's Abraham Lincoln, four score and seven years ago. That was a great speech at Gettysburg. John F. Kennedy, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. That's greatness in speaking. And there's Winston Churchill, who declared, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. I'm not English, but that makes me want to fight. And then probably the greatest speech of our era was given by Martin Luther King Jr., his I have a dream speech. That was a classic. These were all great speeches, famous speeches that many people know about. But I want to suggest today that the most famous speech, the greatest speech of all time, was given by a Galilean carpenter named Jesus. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. You can find it in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. The Sermon on the Mount begins with a list, a list of the kind of people who are blessed in this life. Jesus starts off and says, Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And he goes on with several more. He's saying that you're blessed when you do certain things. Now, to under, understand what Jesus is saying, you got to know what the word bless means. What's it mean to be blessed? What is that word all about? Well, I'm going to get into that, but first of all, I'm going to tell you what blessed doesn't mean. And in order to do that, I'm going to give you a couple of stories from Beth's life. You know, when my wife Beth was a little girl, she was kind of mischievous. She was full of it. Well, she was naughty. She was a naughty little girl. And um, her father was the pastor of a little country church in Wisconsin. And on one special occasion, the bishop came to visit their church. And Beth was introduced to the bishop. She started to talk to the bishop. And then her dad went off to take a phone call or something. Beth lied to the bishop that day. She told the bishop that she was suffering from polio. He believed her. He was moved with compassion. And the bishop laid hands on little Beth, prayed for her, and blessed her. Well, that's not the kind of blessing I want to talk about today. The second story I want to tell you is that when Beth was a little girl, her family would attend camp meeting revivals under a big tent. People under in those revivals would worship God very enthusiastically. When something would happen and this exciting would happen in the service, the ladies would say, we're getting blessed. And when they got blessed, they would run around waving white hankies. That's not the kind of blessing I'm talking about today either. What does it mean to be blessed? Well, Webster defines the word as the state of being happy, fortunate, or favored in some way. Webster defined it as a wholesome and beneficial atmosphere of life that comes as a natural outcome of a God-honoring life. I know that you all want that. You want to be blessed. You want to be happy. You want to be fortunate. You want to feel favored. 
you want to feel blessed. And it sure beats the alternative, which is to be cursed. Our passage today says that Mary was blessed. She had that happy, fortunate state of being. She was favored by God. God was pleased with her. You might say that she got a smiley face on her spiritual report card. Now, in contrast, Zechariah in the story was not blessed. He was cursed. He was not in a happy, fortunate state of being, as Webster says. God actually was disappointed in Zechariah. And because of that, Zechariah lost his ability to speak. I guess you could say he didn't receive a smiley face on his spiritual report card. When my son Brian was in the second grade, he was quite a bit like his mother. He was very challenging to his second grade teacher. And she tried to reward him on the days that he had good behavior. On the good days, he would she would send home a paper with a smiley face on it. And if you got enough smiley faces, you would get a prize. I want to ask today, do you get a smiley face from God? How do you get that smiley face? How do you receive God's favor? How do you receive God's blessing in your life? Well, the answer is found in verse 45, where it says, Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Mary was blessed because she believed. She believed what God had told her. She didn't question it. She didn't doubt it. She didn't hesitate about it. Mary believed that God would do what he said he would do. She believed it, and she didn't ask for documentation. She didn't ask for a second opinion. She didn't apply the scientific method. When God said it, she just believed it. God had made a promise to her. He had said to Virgin Mary, I'm going to give you a baby. This is going to be a world-changing baby. No man would be involved in the conception. It's just going to happen. That's a difficult thing for any young girl to believe. And in the story, Zechariah, he couldn't handle it when he got a message like that. He doubted. He wanted to mull it over. He didn't buy in. But Mary... Because God said it, she believed it. She believed and trusted in the promises of God. People like Mary make God smile. People like Mary get God's blessing. Here's the progression. You hear what God says. You believe what God says. You trust what God says, and then you build your life around it. Let me say it again, because it's important for you and me. You first hear what God says, then you believe what God says, you trust what God says, and then you take action. You build your life around God's promise. Now, I don't know this for sure, but I can imagine Mary's reaction when she hears the news. God says, Mary, in nine months you're going to have a baby. Well, okay, God, if you say so, that's good enough for me. And what do you think Mary did? Well, I expect that on the day after the angel visits her, she gets up in the morning, she goes to Wegmans, she stocks up on Pampers, she stops at a garage sale, buys a crib, she calls the OBGYN and schedules an appointment. She's acting on what God says. She goes and asks Joseph to add a room on the house. She looks in the paper for Lamaze classes and schedules her baby shower. Then she travels to Elizabeth's house to swap pregnancy stories. Now, maybe a few of those details wouldn't happen in the first century, but you get my drift. Mary believes what God says, and she trusts in what God says, and then she does something about it. She starts building her life around God's promises. In this regard, Mary is a lot like some other biblical heroes. I think of Jeremiah. 
God says that he's going to give the Israelites back their land someday, and so he goes out and buys a plot of ground. He starts investing in what God has said. I think of Noah. God says there's going to be a flood, so he doesn't sit around. He picks up a hammer and saw and starts to build an ark. He's acting on what God has promised. I, I think of Abraham. God says, I'm going to give you the promised land. And so he packs up the donkey and heads west. He acts upon his belief in what God has promised. Blessed are you who believe what the Lord has said to you and will be accomplished. Blessed are you when you take God at face value. Blessed are you when you hear, believe, and act upon it. All throughout the Bible, we are barraged by wonderful promises of God. The Bible says that we can give generously and God will provide. God, the Bible says that we can humble ourselves and God will lift us up. The Bible says we can conquer our addictions. God will break our bondage. The Bible says we can reorient our thinking. God can heal our attitudes. The Bible says we can change in a number of ways. God can take your life in a whole new direction. All throughout the Bible, there are wonderful promises of the things that God can do. Even in Luke chapter 2, in Mary's song of praise, there's a collection of promises. It says that God will give you mercy, that God will lift up the humble, that God will fill the hungry, that God will help his servants. Let me say it one more time. Blessed are you who believe that what the Lord has said to you will be accomplished. Blessed are you when you take God at face value. Blessed are you when you hear, believe, and then act upon it. Now, ladies, after hearing this sermon today, getting a huge dose of Mary's great example of this. If you were to go outside today and an angel would appear to you and tell you you're going to have a miraculous baby, if that happened to you, you younger women, well, after this sermon, you'd probably say, okay. For you middle-aged women, you'd probably gulp. Well, okay. For you older women, you would probably gulp 57 times and then maybe say, okay. We've got the angel announcing the baby deal all down, no matter how difficult it might be. But I want to suggest to you today, if you were to open your Bible, and all you timid people out there, all you introverts, you read in the Bible, that God wants you to boldly share your faith. And if you do, God promises to give you things to say. If you read that today, if you read God's promise about speaking up for him, how many gulps would it take before you actually did it? Uh, give me another example. How, how many of you financially challenged people? You know, you people who maybe have had a tough time during COVID, or maybe you're house poor, you bought the big house and now you gotta pay the mortgage. What would happen today if you read in the Bible that God wants you to give sacrificially? And that if you do, he promises to, be, to bless you and give you the money abundantly. I wanna ask you today after reading that, how many gulps would it take for you to actually do it? And then let me ask you today, all you middle-class people who are doing just fine, you read in the Bible today that God wants you to get involved with the poor and the marginalized. God wants you to get involved with mercy and justice. If you read that today, how many gulps will it take before you follow and obey God's promise. How many gulps does it take for you to be obedient? 
Now, there's lots of other things we could mention. The Bible tells us to use your gifts, sometimes in new and risky ways. The Bible tells you to get involved in the life of your church. The Bible tells you to maybe to teach a, maybe God te tells you to teach a class or share your testimony or lead a group. And that if you do, God will empower you in all of that. And again, if you get challenged to try something new and risky, how many gulps will it take before you actually trust God's promise and obey? You know, we can ask the question today, why is it so hard for us to really trust in God's promises? Why, how, how, why is it so hard that we, for us to believe that God will actually do it when he promises to do it? When he promises to empower us and guide us and resource us and help us and strengthen us, why, why do we gulp? Why do we hesitate? Well, I think maybe there's three quick reasons. I mean, maybe we really haven't grasped on an emotional level the bigness of the God we serve. You know, we're so oriented on doing things in our own strength and our own power by, you know, figuring it out and being clever and doing it ourselves. Maybe we're so oriented to that that we're not sure that miracles can happen. We're not sure that God really changes lives. We've been influenced by a culture that has removed the power of God. God's power has been removed from schools and government and TV and God is kind of confined to one pitiful little hour on Sunday morning. But you know, God's much bigger than this. We need to trust him and not trust in our own strength. Well, maybe another reason that we, we don't trust God enough is that we haven't heard enough stories, enough inspiring stories. We haven't heard enough stories of the cool things that God has done. And when we get bold and when we get generous and when we identify with the needy, the things that God can do, maybe we need to hear more stories. Well, and maybe it's just hard to trust God because we're not trusting people in general. We don't trust anybody. You know, some of you have had spouses that you don't trust anymore or parents that you don't trust anymore or employers that you have never have trusted. There are people today who don't trust anyone. They don't trust the government. They don't trust the military. They don't trust the police. They don't trust the church. They don't trust the legal system or the political system. Everything seems so goofed up. We can't trust anybody anymore. Maybe you've been burned badly in a relationship. People that you've given your whole heart and soul to turned out to be bad investments. It's hard for you to invest in anyone anymore. Well, the Christmas message during Advent is that God is way different than any of those people. God keeps his promises. God is believable. God follows through 100% of the time when he makes a promise. God is the only being who is totally trustworthy in this whole world. And when you can trust nobody else, you still can trust God. You know, when I came to faith, I felt pretty alone. I was in a situation where my friends were mostly off doing other things. And I felt like I needed somebody that I could absolutely count on. That summer, I met Jesus and I invested in him. And I gave 100% of myself to him. I gave Jesus free reign over everything I did, and my belief was if the Bible said it, I would follow it. And Jesus has led me through my marriage and my career, my child raising, my everything. And Jesus has never let me down even once, not a single time. Friends, God keeps his promises. And my prayer for you today is that you'll be a blessed person, just like the Sermon on the Mount says. That you'll be blessed because you hear God, you believe God, you trust in God, and then you build your life around his promises. Let us pray. Lord, we are thankful that we can trust you, that you make promises and you make good on all your promises. Lord, if we're not trusting people and 
we've been burned by other human beings and we're kind of leery about trusting anyone. Help us to really trust you. You never fail. You're always with us. In Jesus' name we pray.